He who would do great things should not attempt them all alone. Hmm. Hmm. You know, a couple of summers ago, I had the opportunity to visit uh, the Crow Nation in Montana. And while I was there, I was adopted into the nation by a wonderful couple, couple uh, Hartford and Mary Black Eagle. And I know what they're saying now. Kids grow up so fast. <laughs> Only in America could the adoptive son of Crow Indians grow up to become President of the United States. So. The history of Native Americans isn't very well known, Mr. President. What can you tell us about it? We know the history that we share. It's a history marked by violence and disease and deprivation. Treaties were violated. Promises were broken. You were told your lands, your religion, your cultures, your languages were not yours to keep. And that's a history that we've got to acknowledge if we are to move forward. What can we do to make things better? In the final years of his administration, President Clinton issued an executive order establishing regular and meaningful consultation and collaboration between your nations and the federal government. But over the past nine years, only a few agencies have made an effort to implement that executive order. And it's time for that to change. Now, I'm told there's a Seneca proverb that says, he who would do great things should not attempt them all alone. Hi, I'm David. I learned an Ethiopian proverb that says when fire webs unite, they can tie up a lion. Now, Secretary Salazar and Assistant Secretary Echo Hawk are among the best advocates you could have in Washington, and this department is doing fantastic work under their leadership. But being good partners with tribal nations is a responsibility we've all got to take on. And that's why representatives of multiple agencies are here today. Because if we're going to address the needs of Native Americans in a comprehensive way, then we've got to mount a comprehensive response. The Department of Justice, the Department of the Interior, the Department of Homeland Security, and the Department of Health and Human Services are all working on ways to empower tribal governments to ensure greater safety in their own communities. And I want to particularly commend Attorney General Eric Holder for his efforts on this so far. I know you've heard this song from Washington before. I know you've often heard grand promises that sound good but rarely materialize. And each time you're told, this time will be different. But over the last few years, I've had a chance to speak with Native American leaders across the country about the challenges you face. And those conversations have been deeply important to me. We are glad you understand these things, Mr. President. I get it. I'm on your side. I understand what it means to be an outsider. I was born to a teenage mother. My father left when I was two years old, leaving her, my mother, and my grandparents to raise me. We didn't have much. We moved around a lot. So, so even though our experiences are different, I, I understand what it means to be on the outside looking in. I know what it means to feel ignored and forgotten and what it means to struggle. So you will not be forgotten as long as I'm in this White House. He who would do great things should not attempt them all alone. Hmm. Hmm. I'm not old enough to vote yet, but I am listening and learning now, Mr. President. Just a few days ago, we marked the 150th anniversary of a document that I have hanging in the Oval Office, the Emancipation Proclamation. With the advance of Union forces, it brought a new day that all persons held as slaves would thenceforth be forever free. We wrote that promise into our Constitution. We spent decades struggling to make it real. We joined with other nations in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights so that 
slavery and the slave trade shall be prohibited in all their forms. A global movement was sparked with the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, signed by President Clinton and carried on by President Bush. My teacher said, there are even slaves today and that we should still keep fighting slavery in the world. You've made impressive commitments in this fight. We are especially honored to be joined today by advocates who dedicate their lives and at times risk their lives to liberate victims and help them recover. This includes men and women of faith who, like the great abolitionists before them, are truly doing the Lord's work. Evangelicals, the Catholic Church, International Justice Mission, and World Relief. Even individual congregations like Passion City Church in Atlanta. And so many young people of faith who've decided that their conscience compels them to act in the face of injustice. And groups like these are answering the Bible's call to seek justice and rescue the oppressed. Since there were so many problems, can I help? Can I help? Of course, no government, no nation can meet this challenge alone. Everybody has a responsibility. Every nation can take action. Modern anti-trafficking laws must be passed and enforced. And justice systems must be strengthened. Victims must be cared for. He who would do great things should not attempt them all alone. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, it has been a great pleasure to host the leaders of some of the world's largest economies. I think the surroundings gave us an opportunity to hold some uh, intimate discussions and make some genuine progress. For the past three years, our nations have worked together and with others, first to rescue a global economy from freefall, and then to wrestle it back to a path of recovery and growth. Our progress has been tested at times by shocks like the disaster in Japan, for example. Uh, today it's threatened once again by the serious situation in the Eurozone. And that's why, even as we've confronted our own economic challenges over the past few years, we've collaborated closely with our European allies and partners as they've confronted theirs. Uh, leaders agreed to join a new U.S.-led coalition to address climate change in part by reducing short-lived pollutants. We also announced a new alliance on food security uh, with African leaders in the private sector as part of an effort to lift 50 million people out of poverty over the next decade. When Spiderweb unite, they can tie up a line. It seems I should also study really hard. He who would do great things should not attempt them all alone. Hmm. Hmm. It is unacceptable to me, and I know it's unacceptable to you for us to be ranked on average as 21st or 25th, not with so much at stake. We don't play for second place here in America. We certainly don't play for 25th. So I've set this goal. We will move from the middle to the top in math and science education over the next decade. We are on our way to meeting this goal. We're doing it in a couple of ways. Uh, under the leadership of my Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan, uh, we've launched an initiative called Race to the Top. And through Race to the Top, states are actively competing to produce innovative math and science programs, to raise standards, to turn around struggling schools, and to recruit uh, and retain more outstanding teachers. I'm in the fourth grade, but my teachers hardly ever give us homework. Kids in other parts of the world get tons of homework. But what I've said for a long time is, is that success is not going to be achieved just by government. It depends on teachers and parents and students and the broader community supporting excellence. And that's why last year I challenged scientists and business leaders to think of creative ways that we can engage young people in math and science. It seems like my teachers don't really want to work hard themselves, even though they know I want to be a veterinarian when I grow up. And this is a challenge that will determine our leadership in the 21st century global economy. So we need all hands on deck. Everybody's got to be involved. And I'm pleased that 
There are a lot of people out there who are answering the call. Companies, non-for-profits, they're coming together to replicate successful existing science programs. What about the thousands of teachers who have been laid off? We've got new public-private partnerships that are working to offer additional training to more than 100,000 current teachers and to prepare more than 10,000 new teachers in the next five years. Businesses are working with nonprofits to launch robotics competitions and other ways for kids to make things, make things and, and learn things with their hands. And more than 100 leaders from some of the nation's top companies have launched a new organization called Change the Equation to help us move to the top in math and science education. He who would do great things should not attempt them all alone. Hmm. Hmm. Hi everybody, welcome, I'm your host, Binary Mouse.